So last week, Mark Driscoll, in a sermon to his church, Trinity Church down in Scottsdale, Arizona, that didn't sound right, but I'm pretty sure that's right, uh, he gave a sermon and in an illustration talking about criticism. Uh, it, it got a little bit interesting because he started bringing up some of the stuff from Mars Hill. Uh, I did a video last week about it, but there's been some more information. Uh, Julie Royce did an interview with Sutton Turner, who was the former executive pastor at Mars Hill and served closely with Mark Driscoll, and he had a lot to say. But just in case you don't remember what Mark Driscoll said last week, let's go over here and uh, have a little listen. I said, God told me a trap was set. So I asked him, I said, do, do, do you know what that might be? And these people that we had known said, uh, yeah, the nuclear option was we were going to accuse you of adultery. It's a big one. This was at Panera, multiple meetings at Panera. It's like, you guys discussed accusing me of adultery. You know that's not true. I've been faithful to my wife my whole life. I adore my wife. I love my wife and she loves me. We've been faithful to each other. We've been open our whole marriage about any struggles we have had because we know that every married couple has some hardship to go through. And we have never been dishonest, but we have never done that. We've never done anything remotely like that. Hmm. They said, yeah, that's why we kept it as the nuclear option. I was like, to get me what? They said, to get you out of the pulpit. They said, because we knew that if we accused you of adultery and enough of us signed the open letter, that ultimately there would be such a media firestorm that you would have to exit ministry, exit preaching God's word for probably a year while a full investigation was done. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a sec and just remind you what I said last week was that this was a master class in gaslighting. Uh, now, gaslighting might not be a term that you're super familiar with. But what that means is you're trying to get people to look past something, uh, look past something that's obvious, and you're manipulating them through details, whether they're true or not, but uh, missing some key information. You're trying to give them something really to look at while they're not paying attention to what is clearly in front of them. Uh, and a lot of times emotions are a part of that. You uh, emotionally manipulate people. And what he's doing here is he's giving this illustration when he's talking about like criticism as leaders and as pastors, and he's going to make a turn in a minute to apply it to his congregation here. Here's what you should do about this information that I'm giving you. But the information that he gave um, cannot be proven to be true because he's talking about secret conversations that he's had, except now we have former Mars Hill elders, uh, Sutton Turner, like I said, the executive pastor, former executive pastor of Mars Hill, and also uh, Miles Road, Rody, maybe, uh, who I believe was in charge of the campus in Spokane uh, at the end. Uh, but he is also coming out and saying that these things are not true. Uh, but let, let's keep on listening to what he has to say here. During that time, we could take over and lead and be in charge. And, and then we figured one of two things would happen. Either you would come back, but we would be in charge, or you would never come back and you'd be done forever. I came home, I told Grace, I was like, oh my God. Multiple people told me that to my face on separate occasions and days. Okay. So that's important too, because what he just said is that it wasn't just one guy and it wasn't just at this one place, you know, at, at Panera, Panera. Like, I guess if Rise and Fall of Mars Hill was still going with the story, that would probably be the name of the episode. I want you to be, if I'm going to be your pastor and I love you. I promise you this, I'll always tell you the truth. And there I want you to love and honor and respect Christian leaders and pastors. Don't assume the worst, assume the best. And don't believe everything you hear and don't contribute to the gossip that just takes lies and gives them life. So that's, that's what it looks like to gaslight a church, right? Like that he's saying, 
you know, don't pay attention to the podcast. Don't pay attention to, you know, all these things that are being talked about, you know, regarding me and my past. Don't look into any of that. Trust me. You know, I'll tell you the truth. Some people took umbrage with the fact that I said that uh, he said uh, I, I would never lie to you. I was more of just referencing what he said rather than direct quoting. Uh, but I mean, that's what he says. It's, it's synonymous. Okay. With I'll always tell you the truth also means I'll never lie to you. Uh, but here he is saying that now some of these elders from Mars Hill, uh, who, you know, had went through the whole process and, you know, he's saying multiple people told him that they were going to do this. They don't like the fact that Mars Hill, or uh, that Mark Driscoll is still going around saying these things. And so Julie Roy sat down with Sutton Turner, and uh, I believe it's Miles Road, Rode, I'm, I'm not sure on the last name, but former pastor at uh, Spokane uh, that, at that campus. Uh, but she sat down with these two, and I really want to focus on what Sutton Turner had to say. Sutton Turner is a really important person in the story. Now, if you listen to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, uh, you, you heard about him. Uh, he enabled Mark Driscoll. Let me, let me be clear and upfront. Uh, this is not just, uh, you know, someone who was a victim, all right, uh, of an abusive pastor. Now, is there a part of that? I'm sure. Uh, and especially as he goes into the details of some of the things, he gives one story that's just going to shock you. And it, and it shocked me too. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of things, uh, about Mark Driscoll and stories. I've had people reach out to me, telling me some things about, uh, their time there because that video that I did that went all over. Um, so I've heard some stuff, <laughs> but this, this was something new that I hadn't heard before. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Uh, but I'm sure that that's part of what happened with Sutton Turner, uh, is that he was a victim of an abusive pastor, a manipulative pastor, uh, someone who was trying to build a kingdom for themselves and not concerned about the sheep, uh, or at least not as concerned as he should have been. Uh, and you'll, you'll see what I mean by that. That's part of Sutton's, uh, story, but he also enabled him. Uh, and this is, this is pretty, uh, common for these kinds of stories about pastors like this, by the way, not every pastor is like that. Let me be really clear with you. Not every pastor, not even every mega church pastor is like this. Um, but uh, in stories that are similar to Mark Driscoll's, usually there are people who have uh, kind of uh, a foot in both sides of a camp of being an enabler and also being victimized by a manipulative, abusive pastor, being spiritually abused. Uh, and Sutton seems to be one of those guys. Uh, you can hear different people uh, saying all kinds of things about, um, uh, you know, some of the things that Sutton would say to them, how he would try to uh, get them to do certain things for Mark, a lot of that kind of stuff. So let me be clear about that. But I want us to look at uh, a few of these clips uh, from uh, Julie Roy's interview uh, with Sutton Turner. I think it's important. And I'm going to draw some things. There's, there's a couple things that I think we can draw into our daily life about this kind of stuff, how we deal with pastors, but also some of the things that we see going on, uh, even with Doug Wilson. Yes, I said his name again. Here we go. Someone taking time to read through what these elders did and how they were praying for Mark and how they wanted Mark ultimately restored they wanted to see him repent. They wanted to see him reconcile, but they wanted him to, to be restored. Uh, so what what he's getting into here is that, uh, you know, he's he's upset by Driscoll saying that, hey, these guys had it out for me. These guys were my enemies. In the context of the sermon that he gave, he's he's really trying to um, get them to look at these Mars Hill elders as people that were not just opposing Driscoll, but really trying to get him to fully be like, these guys are enemies. And, you know, for him, they, they were trying to do their job. They were trying to be good elders. They were trying to, um, you know, be, um, you know, protective of the, the church. And also, you know, for, uh, he even referenced it in the story, 
a lot of these guys were saved under the ministry of Mark Driscoll. It wasn't just like he was some pastor that got hired. He's the pastor that started this whole thing. And a lot of them got saved and grew spiritually grew up in this church uh, and then were called to be elders of this church. And now they got to do some discipline with the the guy who led them to Jesus. That's difficult. That's that that messes with your mind. And so he's trying to show like, hey, we weren't his enemies. We loved him and we were trying to get him restored. We we were doing it for the good of the church, but also for the good of Mark. And um and that never happened. And then for him to say that those men were discussing adultery, it's just a flat lie. I mean, like I have every meeting note and let me just tell you, there was none. When he talks about a nuclear option, that was a word that I used in early 2013 when we were talking about setting up the board of elders. And the nuclear option was basically uh, all of these churches being separated in independent churches, which actually is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, these churches did. But that was the nuclear option. Um uh, and that was around an investigation of one of the three of us that were executive elders. If we were found um, guilty of former charges and we were having to be removed from our position, that was. So that's huge. What he, what he just said is that they had a plan. If something were to happen with uh, him or I think it's was it Dave Bruscus? There's there's a couple of different days I'm forgetting. Uh, with Mars Hill, but another pastor and uh, Mark Driscoll, they were kind of like the the three who were really in charge of what was going on at Mars Hill. And I think that's probably horrible to think about, like the size of that church. And really, it's only three guys. And uh, really, it seemed like Mark had gotten his two yes men. Uh, but uh, he's saying that if something were to happen with any of them, so not just Mark, but if it had happened with Sutton, if it had happened with Dave, then this was going to be the nuclear option of how we deal with this thing. If they were convicted, basically, uh, he's talking about things a little bit odd because it's a non-denominational church with a lot of Pentecostal Baptist theology attached. But he's really talking about this as like a almost like a Presbyterian, how they have like different courts and different things like that. Jeremy Collins is in the chat. I'm sure he can shed some light on how all of that happens. But essentially he's saying if they went through church discipline and it was found out that, uh, you know, there, there was something awful that happened here and they were removed from their leadership positions, they would take these campuses and they would all become separate uh, independent churches. And eventually that's what happened. But what he's saying is that's what was talked about as the nuclear option, not, you know, this, uh, let's make up false things about Driscoll and spread it around. So he gets kicked out of ministry. What that was. And then, um, and when he talks about an investigation would have to be launched, there was already an investigation of 25 formal charges that disqualified Mark Driscoll based on arrogance, domineering, and uh, what was the other one? Quick temperedness. Mm -hmm. um, so like, like, and, and that's what he still doesn't acknowledge to today. He was found disqualified and the people that investigated him and had over 20 or excuse me, over 40 different interviews with people that were directly sinned against that's the information that they did they did a full investigation and that's why i produced all of those uh notes so that it's don't take my words for it read the people the elders of the church that investigated mark driscoll read their own words read how they wrestled with this horrible thing that they had to do um and to go through and read mark's response um, to key. being formal charges, read how he blows up, read all of those things and see for yourself, make your own judgment. Don't allow Mark Driscoll to sit there and say that he can. St all right. He's going to go into something that I think is really important, but what he's, what he's saying is that there, there are accounts of the meetings and uh, there's a link in the description of this video to Sutton Turner's notes 
uh, they, he kept really good notes about what was being said in these conversations in this investigation of Mark Driscoll, some of the accusations, and a lot of it, he's right. Uh, Mark Driscoll says, yeah, I did that. Uh, yeah, I did that, but you know, you took it wrong or that's not that big a deal or whatever. And then some of those times he just gets angry and, uh, yeah, you can see that very clearly in, in the notes of these meetings, but listen to what Sutton says now. Sorry. Like for anybody (laughs) to be as arrogant, to think that they can stand in front of Jesus. I mean, I'm sorry. Like all of us fall short of the glory of God and Jesus is sinful life. We all have fallen short. So for anybody to me to say, I can't wait until the day I stand in front of Jesus and tell him how good I am. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable. It's, it's shocking to me. Um, So I just, those are my first, it gets me so upset um, when it went, went around those men like Miles Rohde. I mean, the reason why probably Miles was able to reach out to you, he he had a long history of military uh, career. That guy's not scared of anybody. Um, and I'll tell you, he's dang sure not scared of Mark Driscoll. And that's why he, he probably responded. Other of us, I know I was terrified of Mark when I lived, when I worked there. And most of those guys still eight years later are probably terrified of Mark as well. And that's one of the reasons why it, it, I'm, I'm still nervous to talk to you, but I know that I'm not in full-time ministry and I feel like that I am able to talk with you and share what happened. Man, so much, so much in that, that last part of that clip. First, he talks about how, how could anyone do this and say, you know, I'm going to stand before Jesus and give account. And I'm, I'm so excited for Jesus to like acquit me basically (laughs) of uh, saying that I was in the right when like for him, Sutton, he knows he was there and the other elders know, and they were there. Some of the things that were said and that were done, we don't other than the notes, uh, we don't get the feeling of what it was like to be in that room with him when he's reacting in some of the ways that he did react. Um, it's, it's shocking. And that's, that's true when it comes to a lot of these stories of people like Carl Lentz, uh, and Brian Houston and, uh, Tullian Chickvagian. I don't know. I don't know how to say his name, Billy Graham's grandson. Um, but you know, all these, all those kinds of figures, and those are the popular ones, but we all know that there are stories of people like that who are just small town pastors and, and they get accused of things and it's not everybody, but when that happens, you know, a lot of times we hear stuff like this of like, I was in the right and I can't wait to stand before Jesus and give my account. And it's like, do you know what you're saying? That those are big words. Okay. Like you you're going to get in front of Jesus and say what you did, what you said was okay. That's awful. That just shows me that you don't really understand what's happening with who Jesus is. Uh, he isn't just, yes, he's loving, but he's also righteous and holy. And, and yeah, it's like, it's shocking. I think that's the word that he used. It was shocking. And uh, I, I agree with that sentiment. Also, when he gets into this and he's talking about fear, like that, that is such a a real thing. And you can tell even as like you, uh, look at, look at how he was talking. Um, he he's, he's being honest. I believe him, uh, that he was, he's scared. He's still scared of Mark Driscoll. And there are many others who are at that church and they were scared of their pastor, scared of their pastor. What is going on when, when your congregation and those you work with are literally terrified of you like that? What does that speak about your character? And there, there are people like him to go down to Arizona, plant this church, start this new thing, and then to be allowed back guys. I made a video, Matt Chandler went to the same conference, spoke at the same conference as Mark Driscoll. We see this more and more. It's not just like the hyper charismatic people. It's not just Morris and Gateway Church. There was a picture. I didn't even put it up on here. Um, But Stephen Furtick, 
uh, Stephen Furtick taking pictures with Mark Driscoll. It's those guys, but also there are avenues that are opening up for Mark Driscoll. I'm going to show you in just a minute uh, a connection between uh, those in the Reformed camp and Mark Driscoll, despite Mark Driscoll saying that Reformed theology is trash. He said it, okay? I didn't say it. He said it. Uh, but let's look at one more clip uh, because some of you guys, I still get comments saying, hey, Mark's not that bad. He's not that bad. You're over-exaggerating things. Uh, he just maybe was a little bit too rough, you know, just a little bit, uh, a little crass sometimes. Let, let's hear a story from Sutton Turner that I think is going to shock you. Before I do that, I do want to say, hey, uh, hit the like button. If you like me talking about this kind of content and trying to hold in some small way people accountable and uh, kind of inform you as well to these kinds of things, Hit the like button. It does mean a whole lot for me. But let's head back over here and let's listen to the story. There was a lot of accusations that were during and it really started um, uh, in 13, 2013. Um, but the 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 formal charges, the 25 formal charges are are listed. And I've actually in my notes that I published um, pulled some of those items when the uh, investigating elders um, uh, literally ask Mark about each one of those charges. And many of those you will read, he says, oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, I did that. He admits to the sin. Um, and um, so, yes, I saw some, um, and I'll just give you an example to give you. So, so what he just said was super important. Like, in those notes, he, he says, I did these things. It isn't just, oh, you guys are making things up or it's a trap, you know, that was set before me. God told me that there was a trap. It's not that. He did things and he said things and he said, I, yeah, I did that. He's just saying it's not a big deal and it's not disqualifying. But listen to this story. You, um, from, from that, we were at um, Ballard. Um, that was one of our, our churches, our 15 church locations, um, the oldest um, church location. Um, and uh, it was eight o'clock. So we had the, we had an eight o'clock service. So typically sometimes we would do five to seven services. Mark would preach five to seven services on a weekend and we would go to different churches typically. Uh, the eight o'clock service at Ballard was very young. A lot of young people would come. Uh, there was no time limit on the out. I've been to that campus, by the way, like back in the day. Uh, I, I like checking out what, uh, you know, Mars Hill was doing. When I say these things, uh, it's not like I'm someone who's completely detached. I wasn't a member there, but, uh, you know, I was a member of a different church. But I, I enjoyed Mark Driscoll at the time. Didn't know a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah so side of it so typically he could preach for as long as he wanted to and um, one night we did a call to baptism um he uh it was an incredible response to the gospel a lot of people wanted to go and get baptized during the day at ballard they had run out of towels and shirts um because we would provide short shirts and shorts to people so um when i saw the response I was trying to find at backstage, trying to find towels and things. The campus pastor and some of the other people were running. Mark, um, when he. A common problem, by the way, like not, you know, not like the problem of, oh, we're just having too many people get baptized. You usually don't have that kind of problem. But, oh, we didn't plan for enough uh, people. Uh, we need to go get chairs. Everybody run, go find some chairs. You know, stuff like that happens all the time. A common problem that a pastor would run into. And yet this is the response. Realized what was going on. You know, we're playing music. People are getting baptized. Mark grabs somebody by the, by the throat against the wall and says, and I'll clean this up because there was a lot of cuss words. Um, but um, he was mad at the person for not having enough shorts and enough uh, shirts. And I'm about to rip your head off and uh, excrete down your neck. And this is full up against the wall with somebody 
um, that was uh, actually a pastor uh, of the church. Those are the types of activities. So when people say, Mm -hmm. why were you scared of Mark? Like, like, yeah, I mean, Mm. you would be scared. Look at his face, man. That's awful. Sutton, I'm sorry that you had a pastor like that. Um, That's horrible. Uh, You know, this is not just someone saying, oh, I heard, you know, for those who are here and just want to be like, Dean, you're gossiping, which I know are some of you guys. uh, This is not, oh, I heard something. This is someone saying, I saw this. He was, he was there. And Mark Driscoll took a guy, a pastor, because they couldn't find shirts and towels, took him. And instead of being like, hey, let me let me go and try to find some of these. We, we got to get this done. You know, like stress happens. But I've been stressed out. <laughs> I've never I, I've been. Oh, oh, junk. You know, we got it. We got to go find those chairs or we got to do something. Uh, you know, we got people here. We need to get this done. You know, that happens. Uh, I've never seen a pastor react like this. of Putting someone up to the to the wall, choking them. And saying such vile things, I'm sorry, I probably should have given a little bit of a, like, advisory, um, but he, he cleaned it up. But, I mean, you can, you know what he said. Um, that's awful. This guy is not qualified. Guys, it's not just, oh, because a podcast didn't like him. Oh, because, uh, you know, John MacArthur said he has a potty mouth. It isn't just like those things. These are people in the church that he pastored who he hurt. He physically assaulted this dude, like this campus pastor, over towels and shirts for baptism. God was doing something awesome. Julie Royce pointed this out in in that interview, that God was doing something awesome. And while God was doing something awesome and people were getting saved, people were getting baptized, the pastor of of this big church is in the back choking out a campus pastor because they can't find towels. Where's, where are his priorities at? And what is he really concerned with? Who cares? People, people can dry off. It's Seattle. It's not the Arctic. Like, come on. Ah, so much, but you know, some people are just forgetting about these things. This is why it's important to keep on pointing these things out. You know, I know some of you guys are like, well, Dean, why do you have to keep on talking about these kinds of things? Because you guys keep forgetting, you know, not maybe not you specifically, but people keep on forgetting who this guy is. Matt Chandler being willing to go and speak at a conference that he's uh, also speaking at, uh, not just like doing like a little breakout session or something like that. I mean, this is it's it's a big deal to be able to be like, I affirm someone by I'm going and speaking with them. And you guys know it because people pull out of stuff when it's someone who has like a, you know, that leper's touch of cancel culture. Uh, they, they pull out of different things because that person is there. It matters. And now people are, they don't care about it because Driscoll went and he, you know, we forgot about it. He's down in Arizona and he's just doing his thing and he's speaking in the charismatic circles. And, you know, maybe you care, maybe you don't about what's happening in those charismatic circles. Uh, but then, uh, you got stuff like this. I tweeted this, by the way, I always have to say it when I talk about my Twitter, go and follow me on Twitter. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I might hit a thousand followers today. I'm, I'm kind of excited about that, but uh, here's something that I saw. Uh, so Canon Press uh, is the publishing arm of Doug Wilson, and uh, I guess it's, you know, I did a little short about it. It's no quarter November, and so all the, the Wilson fanboys are out looking looking for blood. Uh, they're, they're circling, and I see them here on my channel. Hi, guys. Uh, but, uh, they, they, they like this fire stuff. They think of themselves as pirates. And so, uh, they put out these videos every beginning of November, apparently for the last couple of years, uh, where they light stuff on fire. And, um, by the way, come on, we all know it's CG, like stop pretending like it's actually on fire. It's CG. Uh, I mean, I'm sure something is on fire, but it ain't sitting next to Wilson anyways. Uh, so, uh, he, 
put out this video of this fire thing to get things all riled up for his followers. And uh, they start tweeting at all kinds of people. And of course, most of them are ignoring him because, uh, you know, it's Doug Wilson. Um, but not this guy. Pastor Mark Driscoll says, well done, Pastor Doug and team. Uh, just and I, I put it as and the old alliances have returned. You know why? Because these two, they've been connected for a long time. You just didn't know about it. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I remember uh, all this stuff that that happened. I remember these figures. I remember Driscoll platforming Wilson. It didn't go the other way around, guys. Like, some people think, oh, Wilson platform just... No. Uh, for many people in the Pacific Northwest, the first time that they heard about Doug Wilson was because Mark Driscoll had him on a stage. And they were the exact same thing. They sounded the exact same thing, uh, same way. They were into the same stuff, the same kind of patriarchal views that even Driscoll teaches today. Where'd he get those from? I wonder, <laughs> like these guys are connected and they've been connected the whole time. They just kept it on the down low. And now that people don't care too much because the podcast's over, there's no season two. So who cares, right? It's everyone forgets because of this 24 seven news cycle. Well done, Pastor Doug and team. Uh, there was one uh, quote tweet, uh, Wendy Alsup, who uh, was there at Mars Hill. Uh, she said, folks, Doug Wilson has every uh, last problem that Mark Driscoll has, and he always did. I still can't fathom how Wilson has been tolerated by so many of the same folks who condemned Driscoll. I think that's very appropriate. Like these guys are linked. Driscoll cut from the same cloth as Wilson. Uh, and both of these men are disqualified for different reasons. Granted, all right, different reasons. We'll see. We'll see how things happen in the future. Um, but for right now, it's Wilson over theology, and Mark Driscoll out of character. And uh, yeah, so that, I, that, those are some of my thoughts about this whole thing. Don't forget about these people. Just because you know, hey, that that podcast is over. People aren't talking about it anymore. Don't forget who these people are and what they've shown themselves to be. Uh, I have a video over here where I get into a little bit more of what Driscoll said specifically to his church. And if you're here watching live in about 30 seconds, this is going to redirect into an ask me anything kind of stream. Uh, so I will see you over there.